the question that I've been getting constantly is, how do you spell Feshrift? <laughs> so we'll put that to bed. F-E-S-T-S-C-H-R-I-F-T. -S -S the question that was asked more, most frequently to uh, Sinclair was how do you spell Schleiermacher? <laughs> I had a course on Schleiermacher in seminary and the professor said one of the students on his exam, or on his term paper on Schleiermacher said he would hit the keys S-C-H and then sneeze. <laughs> and that's if you do that, you'll be close enough uh, to how you spell it. Well, for me, I don't know about for you. Oh, a feshrif, by the way. We get the word festival or celebration from the first part of the word, and shrift is the Germanic or Dutch word for writing. And so a series of essays or a writing for a particular festive occasion, it is called a feshrift in the academic world. So now you can impress your friends uh, with that. All right, I was going to say that uh, for me, I don't know about for you, but for me, uh, this conference has been a feast. And I have... Uh, I have been deeply moved by the content of the messages from the Word of God that we have heard. It's just been remarkable. Sadly for me, the feast is over because I don't get to hear any more messages other than the one that comes out of my own mouth and I already know what I'm going to say, so it's, it's not going to be very edifying for me. At least I have plans and I depart from my normal procedure of not using notes and I have quite a bit of them here and I'll probably get lost in them uh, somewhere along the way. But if you would uh, pray with me, I would appreciate it. Our Father and our God, when we look at the glory that you had in all eternity, and we see that from all eternity it has been your perfect plan to redeem your people, and that you have predestinated us from all eternity to a future that will go on forever, and that that destiny that you have decreed from all eternity is that we be conformed to the image of Christ. And to that end, you have prepared us for glory. And so now in this time as we contemplate briefly on what that future glory involves. We beg you for the assistance of the Holy Spirit to interpret for us, for our understanding, those things that we only see through a glass darkly. Help me to help your people, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me read for you from Paul's letter, first letter to the Corinthians. We've heard a lot already from that epistle through these days. And I'm going to turn our attention now to the 15th chapter, which we have Paul's most extensive treatment of the resurrection of Christ, but not only of His resurrection, but of the implications and consequences of His resurrection for us. And so I'd like to begin, if I may, at verse 35. This is after Paul has given his magnificent defense of the truth of the resurrection of Christ. In verse 35 he says, but someone will say, how are the dead raised up? And with what body do they come? 
Foolish one, what you sow is not made alive unless it dies. And what you sow, you do not sow, that body that shall be, but mere grain, perhaps wheat or some other grain. But God gives it a body as He pleases, and to each seed its own body. All flesh is not the same flesh. There's one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of animals, another of fish, another of birds. There are also celestial bodies and terrestrial bodies. But the glory of the celestial is one, the glory of the terrestrial is another. There is one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, another glory of the stars, for one star differs from another star in glory. So also is the resurrection of the dead. The body is sown in corruption, it is raised in incorruption. Sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body, and there is a spiritual body. So it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being, and the last Adam became a life-giving spirit. However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural, and afterward the spiritual. The first man was of the earth, made of the dust. The second man is the Lord from heaven. And as was the man of dust, so also are those who are made of dust. And as is the heavenly man, so also are those who are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the man of the dust, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly man. Let me stop at that point, but I'll come back to this text a little later, God willing, to see how Paul finishes this section. One of the things I try to tell my students in the seminary to have them get past whatever inhibitions they have in their educational inquiry is the cliché, there's no such thing as a stupid question. Don't be afraid or embarrassed to ask your questions because, as Socrates once declared, knowledge begins with the admission of ignorance. And unless we're willing to admit those limits to our knowledge, will remain in ignorance forever. So please be bold and ask your question. And there is a truth buried in that assurance somewhere, but there's also a lie because, ladies and gentlemen, when the truth be told, there really are some stupid questions. <laughs> And when Paul writes to the Corinthians, he doesn't give them the same pedagogical uh, assurance that I try to give to my students, because look how this section begins. Someone will say, how are the dead raised up? And with what body do they come? And Paul says, whoo, that's a heavy question. I'm glad you asked it. No. <laughs> he said, Foolish one. <laughs> that's like, that's really a stupid question. But yet it's a question that all of us ask from time to time. I wonder, don't you wonder what kind of bodies we're going to have in glory? I certainly trust that I'm going to have a better one than I have now. Tell you how these bodies go to seed. Uh, my wife said to me a couple of months ago, she said, honey, when, when we were engaged, you were playing baseball, football, basketball, hockey, boxing. She said, and I knew when I married you that you were going to be involved in sports as long as you lived. But I never thought it would be sumo wrestling. <laughs> I wonder what Robert Schuller would think of that. <laughs> uh, 
That didn't do a whole lot for my self-esteem. <laughs> but when I get to heaven, I'm going to retire from sumo wrestling. I promise you that. <laughs> but I, I've wondered that, you know, because uh, people ask me the question, uh, I've been asked the question, when you get to heaven, who are the people you most want to see? Obviously, you want to see Jesus. That's the first thing. But who else do you want to see? And I say, I want to see Paul. I want to see David. I want to see Abraham. I want to see Jeremiah. All these people. I said, but I'm not going to be there very long until I'm going to ask to see my father. My earthly father. Because when we lose a loved one, time never, ever erases that ache. And we do long for that moment where we will see our loved ones once more. But I've worried about it. Will I recognize him? What will he look like? I trust he won't look like he was when his body was ravaged by disease and the way he looked before he died. I trust he'll look more, far more robust. And, but as soon as I begin to contemplate and speculate on those questions, I run smack against what uh, Sinclair was talking about, chapter one of theology, mystery. Because we really don't get a lot of information in the Bible about what we're going to look like in heaven. But we do have this text that I've just read that gives us some clues and some hints. And before I look at it specifically, let me make one other reference apart from the text. In 1955, Oscar Kuhlmann, the Swiss theologian and biblical scholar, wrote an essay for a series of essays edited by Christer Stendhal from Harvard on the question of the resurrection, on the question of immortality. And he made in that essay a, what I found a fascinating examination of comparing and contrasting the death of Jesus with the death of Socrates. And you recall that Socrates, like Jesus, was executed, but not in Jerusalem, but in Athens. And we have the scene of his last hours in his cell where he was visited by his friends and by his disciples before he drank the hemlock. And that is all described in Plato's dialogue, the Phaedo, not like you call your dog, it's P-H-A-E-D-O. Sometimes in America we call it the Phaedo. But in any case, in that dialogue we have the description of Socrates' death and also Socrates' musings about the afterlife. And what Kuhlmann says is, it is an unbelievable exercise in contrast between Plato's description of the scene of the death of Socrates and the New Testament description of the death of Jesus. If you read the Phaedo, you read where Plato describes the demeanor of his mentor Socrates as he's calmly discussing his imminent death with his disciples, where he's basically eagerly awaiting his demise, almost can't wait to drink the hemlock. He's as calm as pl and placid as one could possibly be in the face of death. Then you turn to the New Testament, to the description of Jesus, when the shadow of the cross comes across his faith as he, face as he enters now into Jerusalem, and he enters into his passion 
which in theology we call the Passio Magnum, the grand passion, the supreme suffering and agony. Socrates is calm, serene. Jesus is terrified, shrinking in horror at what awaits him. He's on his face, bleeding, drops of blood as he wrestles in agon or agony before the Father, pleading with him that the cup that has been set before him, which contains that which is far more deadly than hemlock, that that cup that no mortal has ever been asked to drink before, no mortal was ever qualified to ingest before. And Jesus shrinks before it saying, please let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Well, we could continue to draw the descriptive contrast between the fear and trembling with which our Lord approached His death and the serenity exhibited by Socrates. And at first glance, it may seem that the Greeks had a better view of death than we do. And I want to ask the question, why the difference? Why was Socrates at ease in Zion while our Lord was in agony? Let me suggest a few reasons for that. The first difference is found in the Greek understanding of death itself. It's not by accident that many of the things that Plato argues in the Phaedo is just, are just an extension of what he had labored earlier in his other, one of his other dialogues entitled the Mino Dialogue. And if you've been students of Plato, have ever read the Mino, you know that the Mino Dialogue is named after one of the principal characters in that dialogue, whose name, strikingly enough, was Mino, thank you very much. Just wanted to see if you're listening. Mino was an untutored, unschooled, uneducated, illiterate slave boy who meets the gadfly of Athens, Socrates. And Socrates engages in dialogue with this slave boy and asks him provocative questions, almost like a prosecuting attorney who leads the witness. And these questions are so stimulating that merely by asking the slave boy certain questions, Mino comes up with a perfect and articulate explanation of the Pythagorean theorem. He's a budding genius. A squared plus B squared equals C squared. How many of you have ever heard that before? I had that in bonehead geometry and I still don't understand. <laughs> but Mino grabbed it. Now what was the whole purpose of that? The whole purpose of that display or of that exercise that Socrates took the slave boy through was Plato's way of proving his theory of recollection, namely that all knowledge is not a discovery of new information that we've never had before, but rather is simply a remembrance or recall of knowledge that has always been with us in our souls. Because the soul to Plato was eternal immortal, 
indestructible. And the worst thing that could happen to that soul was through its process of transmigration being put into, God forbid, a physical body. And when the soul is put into a body, it is, as long as it's in that body, in prison. And the prison of that body dulls our understanding of eternal truth, and you just have to go through philosophical exercises to fan the flames of recall to drag out the eternal knowledge that's already there. That's the process of education. And so the reason why Socrates is so calm is because death is his friend. Because what death is going to do is to cause him to shed this mortal coil and release him from prison. Remember that the Greek view of salvation is salvation from the body, where in Christianity it is the salvation of the body. Two radically different views of humanity, two radically different views of salvation. And so there is Socrates sitting in a human prison, which is merely another containment of his soul. And he's going to, he can't wait to get out of both prisons, the Athenian jail and his mortal fleshy prison that will release him. Death is his friend. Death is liberation. For Jesus, death is not a friend. From the fall of Adam onward, death was not a friend. Jesus didn't sing, what a friend we have in death. No, he said, death, death is not only an enemy, it is the enemy, the worst enemy, the last enemy that is to be destroyed. How marvelous were the words of truth that we have heard already of the victory of Christ over the works of the devil. The devil who works hand in hand, arm in arm, with the angel of death. And the devil with all of his hellishness has invested death with the venom and the sting of a scorpion. And so Jesus trembles before the cross, because he has to take on Satan, and he has to take on death in all of its hellishness. Socrates hums, Jesus cries. For Socrates, the soul was immortal, indestructible. For Christ, the soul is destructible. Don't fear him who can kill the body, but fear him who can kill body and soul and cast both into hell. See, the New Testament, the Old Testament never believed that the soul is eternal. The soul is created 
When God made man in his image, he reached down into the dirt and he shaped and molded that clay into his own image. And then to finish this work of creation, he breathes into the dirt his own breath, his own ruach, and man becomes a living soul. It's not just that the body is created by God, but the soul is created as well. And please just let me say in passing, without having a chance to uh, explain it to you, please, please, please. You know, there, there's this view of man that's made a, 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 a comeback in our day. It's very, very dangerous. It's called trichotomy that teaches that we're made up of three parts, body, soul, and spirit, you know, because Paul says in his, one of his benedictions, may the Lord preserve you, body, soul, and spirit, and so on. No, no, no. Every time trichotomy has raised its ugly head in the history of the church, it has functioned as a vehicle for some serious heresy. If we're going to count the different parts that the Bible uses and add them up, you'd have to go to pentotomy or cestotomy or octotomy, you know, because the Bible speaks about the soul, the spirit, the heart, the mind, the bowels, and the body in one way or another in passing. But when the Bible talks about the whole person, it talks about our humanity as having a physical dimension, a corporeal dimension, and a non-physical dimension. In that non-physical, we can talk about thought, we can talk about will, we can talk about heart, we can talk about all of that. But there's no specific teaching in Scripture that we're made up of three distinct parts. Be careful of that. But in any case, the soul in Christian terms, is not immortal. But doesn't Paul in this very text say, it'll be raised immortal? Yes. But never, even in heaven, will your soul be inherently, intrinsically indestructible. When the Bible says that we are sown in mortality and raised in immortality, that means that by the grace of God, the Creator who sustains things according to His omnipotent power rescues us from mortality by promising to preserve us body and soul forever so that the power to last forever rests in Him not in some piece of my existence that's located somewhere between my liver and my pancreas. No. There's nothing about me that is intrinsically or inherently indestructible. Every part of me is fragile. Every part of me is mortal. Every part of me depends for its moment-to-moment -moment existence on God and His sustaining grace. As I said for Socrates and for Plato, the body is a prison. For the Christian, the body is a temple. Now, in this text that I've just read, Paul says, how are the dead raised? Don't you know that what you sow is not what made alive unless it dies? Now, you can argue with agronomists about whether or not a seed, before it germinates, Friedrich Schmidt, actually undergoes thanatos or death. But we know at least it goes through a metaphorical kind of death. Before, you know, when I got, wanted to grow grass up in Pennsylvania, which is no mean feat, and I have to prepare the soil and rake it, get rid of the rocks and put some fertilizer down and everything, then sow the seed. And then what I had to do? I had to drown that stuff. I had to keep putting water on it and water on it and rotting on it so that those seeds would, in its outer shell, its external hard kernel, rots, so that the life that I wanted could spring forth. And what came out was far more lovely than the seed that I threw around the yard. The only bad thing 
is that I didn't have to cut the seed every week <laughs> like I did the grass after it germinated. And we see in this analogy that Paul uses here was used by Jesus Himself when He talks about being the bread of life, that that wheat cannot come forth until the seed goes into the dirt and dies. And the idea is we see all over nature the metamorphosis that takes place between decay and recovery. And Paul, as well as the ancient Greeks, had this in common. They say, look around you. You see life in all kinds of different forms. Microbes that are alive, one-celled creatures that are living, that have no circulatory system, no uh, brain waves, no heartbeat, but they're still alive. You see dogs and cats that aren't functioning the way we are. They're not the same kind of, of beings that we are, but they have life. You see canaries, caterpillars, butterflies. You see myriads and myriads of different kinds of living things. Why should we think that in this vast universe in which we live, the highest possible form of life is the one you and I experience this morning? But Paul is saying, wait a minute, there's something more here. But the great barrier to that something more, the great barrier to the hope that was expressed by Job in antiquity when he raised the question, if a man die, will he live again? That the barrier to that hope is the last enemy, which is death. And so Paul speaks here that all flesh is not the same flesh. One kind of flesh of men, another flesh for animals, another fish, another birds, celestial bodies, terrestrial bodies. This thing here, there's something going on here that I've, I'm not able to understand. Because in the New Testament Greek, we have two different words that sometimes are translated by body or flesh. There's the word soma, and you've understood that word. You hear of psychosomatic illnesses. Suke refers to the inner man, the, the uh, psychological or mental dimension or soulish part of us, where because we have struggles within ourselves in the interior chambers of our soul, they manifest themselves in real illnesses that afflict the body. It's not psychosomatic bo uh, illnesses are not illnesses that are just in your mind. They're real illnesses that are caused by disruptions in the mind. But anyway, we use that word somatic from the Greek soma, which means body. But we also have the word sarx. And here's where it gets complicated, because when the Bible describes our fallen sinful condition, it uses the term sarx. Now, it'd be so nice if I could say, every time the Bible uses soma, it refers to our physical bodies, and every time it uses the term sarks, it refers to our sinful condition of corruption. Unfortunately, it doesn't work that way. I can give you this hint. Just about every time you see sarks in contract to pneuma or spirit, then you have a conflict between the old man, the fallen, corrupt person without the regenerating influence of God, the Holy Spirit, and the new mob, which refers to the new condition, the new man, that you can say. But apart from those closely relationships of occurrences in the text, there are times when sarks and soma are used virtually interchangeably, and that's what happens here in, the, in 1 Corinthians 15, although some scholars argue that there's some big difference going on here. I don't know what it is. But the same thing, if you read your Latin Bible, you will see a distinction in there between the Latin corpus, which corresponds to soma, and the Latin caro, from which we get the word carnal, which corresponds to 
sarks. But they're interchanged in 1 Corinthians 15. So, bottom line is we don't get a lot of help here out of the language. All Paul says is there are different kinds of bodies, different kinds of corporeal substances that are alive. But he does say that when we die and go through death, we are raised in a different kind of body, a resurrected body, which Paul uses the term here, a spiritual body. Now, ask me, ask R.C., R.C., what is a spiritual body? I have no earthly idea because it's not an earthly idea. I don't know what a spiritual body looks like. I know it's going to be like the resurrected, glorified body of Jesus. And it's going to be much better than the body we have now. What Paul is laboring here is that it's going to be different from what we currently have, and it's going to be better than what we currently have. Raised in honor, though sown in dishonor. Sown in corruption, raised in incorruption. Sown in weakness, raised in power. I can't wait for that. But the glorious future promise of our resurrection, which in the Apostles' Creed is confessed by the term resurrectionis carnis. I believe in the resurrection of the body. That is not an affirmation of the resurrection of Christ. It is an affirmation of the result of the resurrection of Christ. Because here's what happens. Let me go earlier into this text that I've just been reading and quickly do it if I can. Verse 20, but now Christ is risen from the dead. And here's the Christian hope. And has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Since by one man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead, as in, Christ, as in Adam all die, even so in Christ, and all shall be made alive, but each one in his own order. Christ the firstfruits, afterwards those who are Christ at the coming. Because, beloved, what happened was Jesus crushed the head of the serpent, and when he did that, he conquered death. We still have to die, but the death that I await in this mortal coil is nothing like what Jesus faced in Gethsemane. Because when Jesus faced death, it still had the sting. It still had the curse. It still had the power of hell associated with it. But when Christ crushed the head of the serpent, he removed the sting and became the first fruits of those who were raised from the dead. And because Christ is risen, we have nothing to fear from death that we should face it with a tranquility that makes Socrates looks like, look like fear. Now, if I can just conclude by turning your attention one more time at these conferences to one of my favorite texts in 1 John chapter 3. Verse 1, behold, what manner of love is this that the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the children of God? We were talking about that in the Q&A. You want to know about imminence? 
You want to know about nearness? It doesn't get any more imminent than to be adopted into the household of God. And here, something we take for granted, oh, sure, we can say our Father. Oh, sure, we can pray to God, Father God. And that's something we just take for granted. But by the time John writes his first letter, he's still staggering in apostolic astonishment that he would have the unspeakable privilege of calling God Father. He said, what kind of love is this? I can't get over it that we should be called the children of God. That's no big deal to you because you were taught when you were in first grade that we're all God's children. And since everybody is a child of God, your syllogism went like this. Everybody is a child of God. I am a buddy. Therefore, I am the child of God. No big deal. It was a big deal to the apostles and it's a big deal to Jesus, and it should be a big deal to the church, because John is still expressing amazement that we should be called the children of God. And then he goes on, what does he say? Therefore, the world doesn't know us, because it didn't know Him. But beloved, now, we, now, not later, now we are the children of God. And it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. Now, maybe John hadn't talked to Paul. Maybe John hadn't read 1 Corinthians 15. But I suspect he did. And what he was saying is that with all of what we have in 1 Corinthians 15, we still have that dark glass that Paul was talking about two chapters earlier. Beloved, we don't know yet what we shall be. But what do we know? What will glory be like? We know that when He's revealed, we shall be like Him. What are you going to be like in heaven? Just like Jesus. Not the way that fellow on TBN talks where he says anybody who's indwelt by the Holy Spirit is just as much the incarnation as God as Christ. No, no, no. You're not going to be a a God-man in heaven. You're not going to have a divine nature in heaven. But touching His humanity, the glorified humanity of Jesus is what we're going to be like. We shall be like Him John says, because we shall see Him as He is. The Latin, in se est. We're going to see Him as He is. What do you think turned the apostles into people who turned the world upside down. We get a hint in the prologue to John. We beheld His glory. No wonder they turned the world upside down. John and Peter could say, we were there on the Mount of Transfiguration when the deity shone through, burst the bonds of the, of the physical nature of Christ, where the divine shone through the human, and they saw His glory. They say, hey, the glory of the only begotten of the Father. We're going to be like Him because we shall see Him as He is. Real quick, I've often wondered, and I've even talked about it at Ligonier Conferences, what the sequence is. Will we be like Him because we will see Him as He is? Or will we see Him as He is because we're like Him? I don't know the answer to that. I think I know the answer to that. Let's look for a minute at those two options. Why can't we see the face of God right now? Why do we serve an invisible God? Why is it that God says, Moses, I'll let my backward parts go past you, and I'll let you get a backward glance of my glory, but my face shall not be seen? Is it because there's something wrong with your eyes? Go to the Beatitudes. 
Some people are promised to be filled. Who? The ones who hunger and thirst after righteousness. Some people will be promised that they will be comforted. Some people are promised that they will be called the sons of God. Well, who are promised the beatific vision? Who are those who are promised that they will see God? Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And what does that tell you? That a necessary condition for viewing God as He is, for seeing Christ in His radiant glory, is the purification of the heart. It's not because we don't have eyes that are good enough to see Him. The problem is there's something wrong with our heart. And it's not until the heart is sanctified. It is not until we are completely purified in that last step of the way of salvation, our glorification, that once we are made like Him, the lights come on. We will know the supreme blessedness, the supreme beatitude. We will experience firsthand the beatific vision, the visio of God. We will look straight into the face of God. We will behold His glory. Because the impediments of the vision of God will be removed. We will be purified that we might see Him as he is. Now, you ask me, well, R.C., if he's invisible, and we have, I don't care if we have spiritual bodies, how in the world are we going to be able to see one who is invisible? Aren't we always going to be destined, even in heaven, to look at some kind of outward theonomy, some visible manifestation of the invisible God, some burning bush? That'd be cool enough. I'd be happy enough. I'd be satisfied with a burning bush. I'd be satisfied with a Shekinah cloud. That would turn me on for eternity. But we're promised more than the burning bush, more than the pillar of cloud. We're promised that we're going to see Him as He is. I talked about this about seven or eight years ago in one of these conversations where Jonathan Edwards speculated about that, and he said, wait a minute. Right now with the bodies we have, for me to see you requires all kinds of things. I have an image in my brain, an idea in my head about what you look like, and it's not a very uh, attractive one. but it's mediated to my mind through my senses. I have a sensory experience where my eyes are bombarded by the sensation of you, and that bombardment, that empirical perception is then going through the optic nerve, the lens, the iris, the cornea, all those parts of the eye, hitting the optic nerve, and then somehow through this chemistry, the nerve stimulates the idea that I am showing on the movie screen of my mind. So my experience of sight, which incidentally I couldn't see anything if the lights weren't on, even if I had 20-20 vision. But Edward says, what's so hard to imagine about an immediate experience of our souls or of our minds immediately perceiving the invisible God? What he is saying is, we won't need eyes. We will need optic nerves to see Him as He is. It'll be direct, a direct apprehension of the glory of God. Well, but I, don't, I, I can't fathom. I don't know what that's. I, I don't know what it's going to be like. But I'm not adverse to trying it out. <laughs> and that remains for us the highest hope of glory that however we are raised, it's not going to be flesh and blood like it now is, all right? We know that. There's going to be discontinuity between us, our present bodies, and our future glorified bodies. But it's not radical discontinuity. There will also be some kind of continuity of personal existence between the bodies we now have. Just when Jesus, when He went in the tomb, He didn't shed that body and come out with a different one. 
the body that he took into the tomb was transformed by the energy of God the Holy Spirit. It was glorified. It was changed. And in that change, it was not a once-for-all experience where God said, I'm going to do this for my son, and this is the last time ever it's going to happen. No. With that transformation, where that vindication of His Son and His perfection, with the triumph of Christ from the tomb, God crushed the heel of Satan, and Jesus walks out of the tomb because death couldn't hold Him. I mean, it kills me that people say, the resurrection of Christ is impossible. No, 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 no. The continued death of Christ was impossible. It was not possible for death with all of its power to hold that one. They could have held me there forever, but it couldn't hold Jesus. And when Jesus walked out of the tomb, He said, take that death. You've had it. Because not only have I beat you for myself, but for all who call upon my name, because I'm the firstborn of many brothers. I've stopped. That will be glory. Glory for you and glory for me. Let us pray. Father, one glimpse of the perfection of Your glory would keep our souls in ecstasy forever. And yet you have promised to us not a momentary glimpse, but a perpetual gaze into the light of your countenance forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. Hallelujah. Amen.